Well, let's um, look back into John chapter 12, and we'll take the next section. Remember, we are looking at uh, that part of Jesus' life is actually the final week of his life. He's entered into Jerusalem. There are many events that take place, not the least of which, of course, are the teachings that Jesus is going to be given. His upper room discourse, the, the Last Supper, his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, and then his betrayal, or his, yes, and his arrest, and all of those things we, we have yet to look at. But right now, we're looking at Jesus as he begins to uh, think about what he brought up uh, in the last section, which is when these Gentiles came to him, remember, and uh, they wanted to see Jesus, and it reminded Jesus of what he was about to do and how when he was lifted up, he would draw them into himself. Actually, that's in our text this morning. But last time, it is, unless a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now, Jesus then is thinking about the death that he is about to endure. So let's read about that in John 12:27 through 36, and we're only going to be looking at, the, at verses 22, excuse me, 27 through 33, and we'll look at the remaining verses tonight. Jesus says this, Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So the crowd of people who stood by and heard it were saying that it had thundered. Others were saying, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. The crowd then answered him, We have heard out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever. And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, For a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light so that the darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become sons of light. May the Lord bless again his word uh, to our understanding this morning. Now I've already mentioned that last time we saw certain Jews, or excuse me, Gentiles, Greeks, who wanted to see Jesus, who wanted not just to see him, they just didn't want to gawk at him, but they wanted to, to talk with him. They wanted to get to know him because they believed that he was the Messiah. Now, we, we understand that these were not ordinary Gentiles. These were God-fearers. Remember, God-fearers of those Gentiles that had adopted the God of Israel as their God. They believed that he was the one and only true God. They had adopted the religion of the Jews as their own. The only thing they didn't do was, uh, you know, receive circumcision. For some reason, that was objectionable to them. So they were God-fearers and not full Jews, which means that they were still separated from the Jews. Now, we read that these God-fearing Greeks had come up to Jerusalem for the Passover in order to worship. But while they were there to worship, there was something that they saw that reminded them of the division that continued to exist between the Gentiles, even God-fearing Gentiles, and Jews. And that was that wall that divided the outer court of the temple, which was as far as they could go, the outer court, from the inner court, which was for the Jews only. It was a continual reminder to them that God had chosen the Jews, they were his people, but the Gentiles were not. And as long as they remained Gentiles and not Jews, as long as they didn't receive circumcision to become full Jews, they would continue to remain separate. Now we also saw that Jesus wanted to see these Gentiles. We realize that when Jesus came into the world, he came to minister primarily to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He wanted to gather them together. But the hour was coming when he would be lifted up onto the cross and die, that he might draw all men to himself, not just the Jews, 
but also the Gentiles, which again is what Jesus meant when he said in verse 24 in our text from last week, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. When Jesus would die, the division that that wall represented, that wall that divided the outer and the inner courts, would be broken down. And believing Gentiles would enter into the kingdom of God together with believing Jews. So yes, Jesus wanted to see these Gentiles, but the time was not, was not quite there yet. Now this morning we see that the work that Jesus had to do to bring this about, to break down this wall, was not going to be an easy work. Jesus had to go to the cross. And there he would have to bear the full force of his father's wrath to open that door wide to all men. But he was willing to do it. He was willing to lay down his own life to free the world from the dominion of the one who had control of the world from Satan and make salvation available to all men. Now this morning what I would like us to do is basically look at two things. I want us to see from this text what Jesus was going through because his hour had come. And again, being our example, I think there's going to be several things we are going to be able to learn from this. But I also want us to see what was going to happen to the world because his hour had come. So first of all, what was Jesus going through now that his hour had come? Well, we see first that Jesus was struggling. He says in verse 27, Now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Now Jesus was struggling. He was struggling because he was human, because he was looking ahead at the things he was going to have to do in order to break down that wall, in order to bring salvation, even to his own people, even to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. He was looking forward to his betrayal, to his arrest, Basically, to his being put on trial, his being rejected and condemned, his being beaten and mocked and put to shame, and then being lifted up on the cross, becoming a curse for his people, and at the wrath that he would have to bear for the sins of his people, the wrath that he would have to bear for our sins, if we are trusting in him this morning. That very thing that would shortly make him sweat, literally sweat, blood in the Garden of Gethsemane as he was looking forward into the fiery furnace, as Jonathan Edwards put it, the fiery furnace of God's wrath. Why would he call it a fiery furnace? Well, because he was looking forward to hell. That's what God's wrath is, is hell. It's not the absence of God, it is the presence of God and all of his fury as he pours out his wrath against sin and against sinners, basically, because they are Guilty. Well, Jesus was going to enter into that fiery furnace on the cross. He was going to suffer that wrath of God on the cross. And of course, being human, he wouldn't enjoy that any more than we would enjoy it if we were looking forward to the same thing. Nobody looks forward to pain, even unimaginable pain, that would make you sweat blood. So then what should he do? Pray that the Father would save him from this suffering, save him from this death. You realize that later in the garden, Jesus is going to be struggling with exactly the same thing. He's going to say in Matthew 26, verse 39, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Now Jesus prayed that because he didn't want to have to drink it if he didn't have to drink it. But of course, there was no other way. It wasn't possible for this cup to pass, and he knew that. Certainly, he knew it as God, but he also knew it as a man. You know, this again shows us the fact that Jesus had two natures. He, he was fully man. I think sometimes we think of our Lord Jesus Christ as a man walking the earth as God in human form. That's not what he was. That's not what he is now in heaven. He is God who has taken to himself another nature which is fully human. He was a divine person in a human nature who had all of our limitations. He suffered everything that we have to suffer. He was tempted in every way that we were tempted. He felt all the things that we felt, which means, of course, he was struggling with the same things we would struggle with because we don't like pain, 
Well, he didn't like pain either, you see. But he knew, even as a man, he knew that this is what he came in the world to do. He knew this because his father had taught him. He knew this because it was revealed to him. He knew he came into the world to lay down his life. This is what it meant to be the Messiah, to lay down his life for the world. And so as Jesus is thinking through these things and weighing both options, first, not to suffer. The father didn't force Jesus to the cross. I mean, we need to understand that. There wasn't anything forcing him. He freely chose to do this. He had a choice, you see. He had a choice not to suffer. Whether, you know, he had a choice really not to go through with this. But if he didn't, if he didn't take this punishment, if he didn't die, we would have perished. His people would have perished, all of them. His father would not have been honored and even the love that the father had to send his son into the world in the first place could not be consummated with his people. We would be forever out of his reach. And of course, Jesus, thinking about that, realized that not going to the cross, that was not an option. He had to go. Secondly, of course, to go through with it, to suffer and die, that he might free us from our sins, save us from hell, and bring us to heaven as he thought about these things. He came to the only possible conclusion. He must obey. And so, he prays in verse 28, Father, glorify your name. This is basically the same thing he will say later in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew 26, verse 39, when he says, Yet not as I will, but as you will. Essentially, Jesus here is praying, Give me the strength, Father, to carry out your will so that your love and your grace might be glorified in the saving of your people. Father, glorify your name. And then we see the Father's response to him. We read in verse 28, Then a voice came out of heaven, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. In other words, the Father is saying to the Son, I have glorified my name through your life up to this point in every possible way and I will glorify it again. I will give you the grace you need to do what I sent you to do. This reminds us again that the Father would never leave Jesus to do this work on his own. He would be with him to the very end, even on the cross. Now remember when Jesus was on the cross, the Father is going to lay our sins upon Jesus. He's going to lay the sins of everyone who would trust in Jesus and credit it to him. And then the Father was going to pour out his full wrath against Jesus Christ and Jesus was going to feel the full brunt of his wrath, that fiery furnace, he was going to enter into it and suffer there. But Jesus is going to know that even when he's doing that, the Father was still going to be with him. The Father had not forsaken him, at least in the sense that, as it it almost sounds like Jesus saying on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knows that when he becomes a curse and the Father has to pour out his wrath upon him, that it's not for his sins, but for the sins of his people. And he knows that that hand that is striking him at that moment is a hand that still loves him. The Father still loves him. The Father would not entirely forsake him. Now Jesus already knew that that was true. He didn't have to have the Father tell him from heaven. But the Father said it audibly in the hearing of the others so that everybody else would know it as well. So that he would, well, basically honor his son by letting those who heard Jesus pray know that his prayer had been answered. John writes in verses 29 through 30, so the crowd of people who stood by and heard it were saying that it had thundered. Others are saying an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes, in order that you may know that I am the Son of the Father and the Father hears me and the Father is going to glorify his name just as he said through me. Now we see here that Jesus surrendered his will to the Father and he was willing to suffer and die. He was willing to give his life, to give us life. But Jesus also did this, let's not forget, to be an example for us to follow. 
I mean, does the Lord ever call us to do things that are difficult? Well, you know that he does. <laughs> That's the way the Christian life is. He calls us to be salt, and he calls us to be light to a world that, I hope you would characterize it the way the Bible does, a world that is wicked. Which means as we're seeking to do that, we will inevitably expose ourselves to hatred and rejection. It's difficult. Now, do we ever struggle with the cost that is involved in obeying what the Lord calls us to do? Well, of course we do. I mean, we're human beings. We don't like pain. We don't like to suffer. We don't like rejection. And yet, doing what the Lord calls us to do means that that is what we're going to have to expose ourselves to and we're going to have to endure it at some level. So what can we learn here from Jesus' example in order to help us do that? Because there's no way to get away from it. If we're going to follow the Lord, that's, that's the path that we have to take. What can we learn? Well, his example, I think, first teaches us and reminds us that we too have a purpose just as Jesus did. He came into the world for that very thing that he was praying for. He had to go to the cross. He knew it in order to save his people. We also have a purpose. There's also a reason why we're here. There's a reason why the Lord saved us from our sins and that is that we might be his witnesses to be the means of saving others. And that means several things. That we might be living examples of Jesus Christ. As Paul says, living epistles that are known and read by all men, we should be like Jesus as much as we possibly can. Of course, he gives us grace to become that way. We don't just work it up ourselves, but we do have to put effort into it. That we live like him and that we share his message with other people. If we don't live like him and we share that message, we're just going to look like hypocrites. We have to have both if we live like him and we don't share the message, no one's going to be saved. They need both. We need to live like Christ and we need to communicate the gospel. So that by doing these two things, that by living like Jesus and sharing his truth, we might be salt in this world. That we might be a preservative to our society to keep it from going the direction it's going. Straight forward into God's judgment. I mean, we do have to come to grips with the fact that what we see going on in our nation is God's judgment against us for our sins. That's why the door keeps opening wider and wider to more and more evil. It's God's judgment. We need, we're the preservative that God has actually put in society to keep it from going that way. And of course, we do that again by living like Christ, sharing the gospel, and I should add, by praying. We do need to pray. But he also has made us to be lights by sharing the gospel with others to point people to the only one who can save them from their sins. We are salt and we are light. That is why we are here. And everything else we do in the world, everything else that we possess in the world, everything has been given to us in order to help us do this work more effectively. I know that you know, we sometimes think of... Um, Christianity is just something I do on the side, something I do on Sundays. Maybe evangelism is something that the super Christians do or maybe we, we only do it once in a while. But this is actually what we are supposed to be doing all the time. This is our main work and the other is just to help support us while we're doing that work. So this is our task. Now if that's why we are here, if that is in fact our purpose, then there really isn't any other choice, right choice, I should say, than to do what the Lord has called us to do, even if we have to suffer for it. And remember, we will suffer. All who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If we're not being persecuted, it's only because we're not living godly like Jesus Christ. Now, his example reminds us, secondly, not only that we have a purpose and that's why we're here, but that God will be with us. He hasn't just cast us into this wicked world and say, fend for yourselves. He is with us to the end. Even as the Father was with Jesus, Jesus said he would be with us. Matthew 28, 20, as he sent 
the disciples out, gave them the great commission. He ends with, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. So he hasn't left us to do these things on our own. He will be with us to help us, to give us strength, to give us power, to give us boldness, even to help us to know what to say when we have the opportunity to talk with somebody about the gospel. Jesus promised that he would help us. Now his example reminds us thirdly that even if we must suffer for doing what he calls us to do, for doing the right things, even if others hate us, even if others reject us, there is somebody who loves us and he always will love us. Sometimes I think about Athanasius, you know, he's kind of the example of the one who stood his ground for the truth, stood, you know, he stood his ground, he wasn't going to budge. I believe that God is triune, that Jesus is of the same substance as the Father, he's equal with the Father in power and glory, eternality, and in every way, and there was a time when he was the only one, it seemed like he was the only one who was standing his ground and saying that, and as opinion shifted one way and the other, he was actually cast out of his bishopric, I mean, he lost his job five times and was exiled out of the country, brought back, exiled, brought back, exiled, and so forth. And on his tombstone, as you recall, it was written, Athanasius against the world. Here was somebody who stood his ground. So even when the whole world turned against him and rejected him and hated him for holding to the truth, he realized that there was still somebody who loved him. And that was the reason why he did this. Not just because God loved him, but because he loved God and he wanted to do his will. So that gave him the strength to do it. It makes a difference. It makes a difference. Well, fourthly, Jesus' example reminds us that both he and the Father will own us publicly, not only here on earth, but on that day when it will matter the most when we stand before him on the day of his judgment. The Lord says that we will faithfully serve him here, that he will say to us on that day, as he says in Matthew 25, 34 through 36, come. You who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Now this isn't meant to be a comprehensive list, but realize that Jesus is commending the sheep for ministering to the sheep. But what about those sheep who aren't yet sheep that need to be ministered to the gospel? What would Jesus say about that? Something like this perhaps. I was lost and in darkness, but you brought God's truth to me. I believe Jesus will say that as well. And if we are faithful to the Great Commission, that's exactly what he will say as we bring the gospel to others and he brings his children, his sheep into the fold. So if we will do his work here, he will own us there. Being hated by the world is really a very small price to pay for what it is that God offers to give us for doing so. So this is what we can learn from the struggle that Jesus was having as he was looking forward to what it is the Father had called him to do. That was the first point. Now the second point is this. What was going to happen to the world because his hour had come? Well, we just saw what this hour meant for Jesus, but what did it mean for the world? Well, it meant that the world was going to be set free from Satan's tyranny. Verse 31. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Now what did Jesus mean by that? Well, you know, Adam was originally given that privilege of being God's vicegerent. And I, I know when I first heard that word, I didn't understand it. Maybe some of you do, some of you don't. Uh, vicegerent basically means his deputy somebody who rules under him. He wasn't the absolute sovereign of the world, but he was the one who was under God, who was basically ruling by his authority, by God's authority. The one who would rule under God over all creation. But when he sinned, 
that situation changed when he fell away from God. He handed that position, as it were, that authority over the creation to Satan. It was basically lost to him. We read in Luke's gospel that when Jesus was being tempted by the devil in Luke chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, well, we read this. He says, And he, that is the devil, led him, that is Jesus, up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Now, I do want you to notice from this text that Satan said, it has been handed over to me. It was handed over to him by Adam. And I give it to whomever I wish. He had the ability to bestow it on whom he wills, which is why we have so many you know, wicked tyrants uh, in the world, at least especially during the time before Jesus came. Now, if Satan had been wrong, if this had been a lie, I, don't you think Jesus would have corrected him? But you'll notice he didn't. He didn't challenge him because he knew this was true. The fall brought the world under Satan's control because it brought about the corruption of every single human heart. Everyone who has a corrupt heart, Satan has control over. And that is why Paul calls him, in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this world. Now we know that the Lord is the one who is ultimately in control of the world, but he allowed Satan to exercise a great deal of influence. That is why the world was in darkness for all those years before Jesus came. That's why the world was characterized, even Israel, as darkness when Jesus comes because of the influence that Satan was exerting upon the world. I mean, all these world-dominating empires were all given to them because Satan was in the background. You remember that there was a passage in Ezekiel where the king of Tyre is being addressed, but yet not the king of Tyre. It's the one who's behind him, the one who put him in that position, the one who gave him that power because he had this influence. But Jesus, you see, was about to change all of this. Let me just mention the reason why the world was in darkness up to that time was because Satan was keeping it in darkness. But Jesus is going to change that by going to the cross, by suffering God's wrath, by offering himself as a sacrifice for sin, he was going to crush the head of this usurper and take the world back. Now this crushing blow was going to be delivered once and for all on the cross, but you know as well as I do, the world would be taken back gradually and not all at once. We read in our passage earlier this morning, the one we read for our uh, reading of, of God's word from Matthew chapter 12, verses 28, 8 and 29. Jesus says, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house? That's exactly what Jesus came to do. That's what Jesus was doing and that's what he would really, well, create the foundation for on the cross when he gives up his life. That is the foundation. Jesus bound Satan definitively on the cross. And now that he is bound, now that he has been cast out, Jesus is free to plunder his house. Jesus did that while he was here in his earthly ministry. He did it after he ascended and empowered his disciples and sent them out. And he is continuing to do the same thing today through his church. That is, through us. Jesus is plundering the strong man's house through us. That's what the Great Commission is. That's what it's all about. Go and make disciples of all the nations. I've cast the ruler of this world out. He can no longer keep the nations in darkness. Go and make disciples of all those nations. And that's what the church has been about from the days Jesus gave, when he gave that commission. Jesus says in John chapter 12, verses 32 to 33, getting back to the point of these Gentiles, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. Jesus says, if, if I am lifted up, if I lay my life down on the cross, I will draw all 
all men to myself. We saw last time Jesus did not mean absolutely everybody who has ever lived, but he means all kinds of men, not just Jews, but Gentiles. And remember, Gentile is just a fancy word for the nations. Everybody who's not a Jew is a Gentile, so that would be all the rest of the nations. In other words, Jesus says, if I am lifted up, I will plunder Satan's house. I will cast out the ruler of this world. I will fulfill the Great Commission. My kingdom will advance. Satan took control of the world when Adam fell. He basically handed over to him. But the second Adam crushes the head of the serpent and he takes it back. Now we saw earlier that we have a purpose in, in this life. He calls us to be his witnesses. He wants us to live like him. He wants us to share the gospel with others. Sometimes we find this difficult to do because of the possibility that if we do this, we might have to suffer pain, we might have to suffer rejection, and we don't like those things. Nobody likes those things. Those are hard things. But we also saw three encouragements to help us overcome this barrier. Jesus is going to be with us. He's going to help us. He's going to protect us. Even if the whole world turns against us, even if everyone hates us and rejects us, he's still going to love us. And if we do this, if by his grace we are faithful to him, he will not only own us here, but he will own us on that day of judgment when it matters the most. I mean, I hope you want him to own you on that day. Don't you want to be among the sheep and not among the goats? I do. Well, I hope you do as well. Okay, so these are encouragements. But here is a fourth encouragement. Jesus, through the cross, has crushed the head of the serpent. Jesus has cast him out as the ruler of this world. Jesus has bound him so that his house can be plundered. Now, we know that Satan is not bound absolutely. We know that's the case. But he is bound in a certain sense that he cannot stop Jesus from doing what Jesus wants, him to, wants to do. He can't stop us from doing what the Lord has called us to do. He can't stop us from, you know, taking men from every nation, making disciples of the nations through the gospel. Now, since we know this is true, we also know that when we evangelize, the Lord is going to convict, the Lord is going to convert, the Lord is going to gather his lost sheep from every nation under heaven. Now, let me ask you a question. What more do we need <laughs> to give us confidence to do these things? That we're going to be successful as we set out to do what the Lord has called us to do. What more do we need than an absolute guarantee that the sheep are going to come? Jesus is going to call his people. They are all going to be saved. And they're going to be saved through our efforts along with all the other things that Jesus has called us to do. You know, we have every reason to believe we're going to be successful. So we, we do need to believe what it is that Jesus says. That's, that's what we need to do. We need to trust that what he says is true, and we need to act upon that. Now let me just say in closing to any here this morning who have not received Jesus as Lord and Savior, you see, there's good news here. Jesus' victory over the enemy of your soul, over all of our souls, also means that he can plunder you from Satan's house. And actually, he will. He will do that if you will only trust him. If you will only turn from your sins and believe on him. Uh, don't stay in Satan's house. I mean, what's going to happen to Satan's kingdom? The house is going to be torn down. The house is going to be burned. It's going to be burned with everlasting fire. And everybody who stays in that house is going to burn along with it. That's what the Bible says. And actually, if you stay in that house, that's what's going to happen to you. But Jesus is willing to save you. He's willing to rescue you out of that house if you will only trust him. If you will only believe on him. He will save you. Jesus, again, calls you this morning. He says, come out of the world. Come out of Satan's house. Come out of his kingdom. Come to me. I will save you. And you will be safe. 
Listen to Jesus as he speaks to you through the gospel and respond to him. He is willing to save you. He can save you. You simply need to look to him in faith. Well, let's, let's bow in a few moments of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help all of us to receive his word as we need to hear it.